This last lecture is easily the most exciting because we get to learn a little bit about what we can expect coming down the pipeline for life sim. What can we what what can we expect to see in the next version? <laughs> when is the next version coming out? That's a good question. Um, the plan is to have kind of the first beta releases ready to go this summer, maybe late fall, and then hopefully with a official release to the public next early next year. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. All right, what to expect in LiveSim 3.0. This will be a relatively quick, quick and fun presentation, um, and then we'll get it to our to our closeout. Uh, should we just power? We had in our in our agenda to do a quick break before that. Do we just want to power through? Yep, I kind of had a feeling we're all on the same boat Thursday afternoon. All right. So overview. Talk a little bit about updates to the framework, the underlying framework to the software. Updates to the logic, which I think we'll be all very interested in. Um, updates to the GIS within LifeSim and then UI, user interface. Sorry. So one of the big things with framework is we're separating the computation engine from the user interface, which provides us with a lot of um, possibilities in the future of running LifeSim on a server, running it as part of a suite of software, so it can run headless is the, ver is the term when it's run without having a user interface. It can be run using batch scripts this way. It provides a lot of flexibility for power users to be able to um, really expand on the LifeSim analysis. Right now, when you click a button, things are happening under behind the scenes. Code is being fired off to, to have you know, processes happen. But the idea then is that with the future, it'll be separate. So when you click the button, it's enacting an action from a separate library. And that separate library would be accessible to anybody. This is really important for, for people who do web development and so on. Uh, this is a fun one. Um, so this is currently what's happening in LifeSim. Oh, I always forget to click on the right one. That is the daughter of James Bolina. Uh, intersect. Right oh, oh, boy. I hope you all have your phones and your camera so rolling on this. Yeah, you know, this when you're going to get you live stream. It only gets closer from down here. Hold on to your, your heads, ladies and gentlemen. Some of them are crazier than others. Oh, boy. 77 sneaking through. We brought a great story to you. Next version of live stream is to get a little bit smarter about intersections and be able to interpret stop signs and stop lights. Mason, don't impact how traffic uh, attempts to come up to an intersection. This, uh, this video was sent after we, um, we sent out LifeSim for an external peer review. And um, one, of, uh, one of the external peer reviewers sent this video back to me. I thought it was hilarious. And so I've been showing it ever since. That is the daughter. All right. We, OK, so another one. Um, so like I said, improving traffic simulation at intersections, that's a big one. That's going to. What I think is going to happen is that's going not going to really impact results significantly, but it's going to give much more realistic visualizations of what's happening on the roads. Um, improved traffic simulation efficiency. Deming's a relatively small data set, so we all ran it with traffic simulation, and it ran relatively quickly, right? We could run it and view results within a few minutes, but if you have a, a population that's in the millions, and you're loading them all onto the network, it can really take a long time to run. It can tra simulate traffic. It can be kind of hard and daunting, and having, a guide, having some type of guidance is going to really help in getting that forward. Um, more on the road network. Um, hydraulic sampling, like we said, it's sampling only in the center, so it requires us to break up that road, those road segments to get better definition on the hydraulics. Um, we want to include better hydraulic sampling at roads. So sample at multiple locations along the road, and then as long as vehicles are on that road, it's it's checking the sampled hydraulics at various locations on the road instead of just the center point. And then time triggered road closures. Uh, somebody before mentioned uh, uh, timed um, contra flow. We haven't thought about implementing that yet. Um, however, we are going to implement uh, timed road closures or triggered by, based on subtype of a depth occurring at a location. That'll be really nice for, for simulating the events where evacuation can occur on the road up until a certain point, at which point um, it's closed down. Destinations, our favorite. We all identified several potential issues with destinations or drawbacks to destinations in LifeSim this week. One is capacity. We don't have a maximum capacity at destinations. That makes it really hard to model internal 
um, destination points, right? Being able to have that maximum capacity so that once that maximum capacity is exceeded, those that are trying to evacuate to that point get there and then realize they have to try to find somebody somewhere else to go. Um, adjust speed as pass through increases. So they don't just stop once they've exited, once they've reached that destination. That doesn't mean that they're gone, right? There's still traffic potentially occurring outside of that. And that can be a real issue in places like LA where, where it's still city beyond it, right? It's not like these open roads that people can just drive forever. So being able to implement some type of a function that as the density of vehicle, as the number of vehicles through a destination increases, so does the impact on slowing down those vehicles leading up to that destination. Waiting destinations. So one of the challenges right now, right, is that um, is that when you're placing your destinations, you got to be really careful, right? If you play one place one destination too close and the rest of them way out there, everyone's going to try to go to that one destination, right? Because they're trying to get to the destination they get to, they can get to the quickest. Um, but that's not necessarily the case, right? So instead, it'd be nice to be able to place our destinations relatively where we believe that they're going to try to evacuate to, and then maybe assign weights to those destinations, meaning this destination is a, is a strong, people are going to be strongly um, guided to go to this destination. Guided is not the right word. Um, they're going to have a, they're going to be more likely to go to this destination than others. So you can weight the, the um, importance of one destination versus another which will, even though somebody could get to a destination faster, maybe they would pick an alternative one because it has a higher weight, because it has a higher probability that people would evacuate to it. Um, and last one here, a fraction of the population that would go home if all options are exhausted. So right now you're driving along in life sim, you're a life sim agent, you come to a flood of road, you're like, oh dang, you turn around. You come to another flood of road, oh dang, you turn around. You come to one more flood of road, you're like, oh, that's, that's all my options. All right, I'm just going to stay here and see what happens. But obviously, that's not what happens in real life, right? People are survivors. They're going to look around. Maybe they saw high ground on their, on their way, or maybe they can see high ground from that point, and they'll try to evacuate to that point. Or they'll try to evacuate back to their home, which is a very common thing. People go out, see things are bad, and then try to go back to their home and, and try to hang tough there. So we want to incorporate that functionality in LifeSim. Uh, yeah, I heard a, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they would be driving back to their home. And, and if, the, if the road's flooded as they're trying to drive back, at some point, if they've exhausted all options, they can't go back home, they can't find any high ground, then they're, then they're stuck. More on the transportation engine. Um, right now, if a vehicle is caught while, while evacuating, um, they're stuck there. The, the, the depths and velocities at that location determine the hazard zone. But in reality, if somebody's caught in relatively low waters and they can get out and start hoofing it, they're gonna do that, right? You're gonna try to walk out if you can, and that could be before the main wave comes through, which would actually be the high hazard situation. So it creates a, the, a scenario where people get caught, caught in their vehicles. If they can open the door, if their human stability hasn't been exceeded, they can get out and try to evacuate on foot. Part of that is um, including another type of network and a, a pedestrian network, right? Because our road network doesn't allow people on foot to go through parks, over open ground, and so on. Um, several resources out there on footpaths can, can provide that information relatively easily for us. So that hopefully will make our lives a little easier. Allow people to abandon vehicle and yeah, evacuate on foot. All right, trip chaining. Right now, right, everyone starts in the structure and they try to reach a destination. I mean, that structure could be where they work, it could be their home, it could be a commercial building like a Target, right? Um, but the idea is that they start there and then they evacuate to a destination. But in reality, people don't always do that, right? If I'm, if I'm in my office in Davis and I get a call that Lake Berryessa is breached, I'm lucky enough to know roughly how long it's going to take for it to reach Davis, but I assume that the warning messaging would let us know. Would I go straight home or would I just evacuate straight from my, straight from my place of work or would I go back to my home first, get with my family, get my kids out of school, and then it all evacuate as one group? Probably the latter. I don't know. My, I guess I like my family enough. I might not. Um, so that's what we would do, right? Uh, a lot of us, we're not just going to go directly from our location 
to our destination. There's trip chaining happening, going home first or going to the school first and so on. We, there's some data resources out there that we can probably use to be able to get that information and identify directionality so that people can evacuate home first before evacuating out. It's pretty neat. All right, support for more hydraulic uh, resources. So right now we have RAS, uh, time series of grids, summary grid data, add circ, and so on. We want to add a few more, make it make it so the capability is there to add more, and that's going to be things like two flow and whatever hydraulic models come out in the future. Correlated sampling between variables. This is a big one, right? Um, right now in MySim, each emergency planning zone is considered independent. So they, even though you have two emergency planning zones and you have a lot of uncertainty about the one and the issuance is going to go out, they both get that imminent half at the same time. Well, right now they're sampled independently. So you, even though you believe, okay, once one receives that, re receives that information from the dam owner, the other one's going to be right there with them and they're going to issue evacuation orders relatively at the same time. That can't really happen. If it does happen right now, it's by chance because they're both sampled independently. But by correlated sampling, we can say, okay, when one receives the warning, the other one's going to be right there with them. So it it's correlates how they're sampled so they act not necessarily in unison, but you can make it so they can either act in unison or relatively close. So that's a, that's a, big, that's a big piece. And that makes a big difference for things like we talked about earlier, the emergency planning zones, right? With the schools, so putting little individual emergency planning zones around various locations, nursing homes, schools, prisons, and so on in our Deming model so that they could act sooner, right? Well, through correlated sampling, we can make that happen a lot easier. Uh, simplify the process to export results for things like total risk. This uh, bullet isn't necessarily as important anymore because we've implemented in total risk the ability to just import results directly from LifeSim. But what about other risk tools? What if you want to pull your results from LifeSim into a spreadsheet model to do, to do a risk analysis? Right now, it's a little bit cumbersome. There's a lot of plots. There's a lot of tables. Well, it would be nice to be able to develop a consequence function right there in LifeSim and be able to export it out as tabular data. So being able to create that so you can create that consequence function for your risk analysis directly within the software. Um, add ability to jump from one morning mobilization curve to another. Every structure has to be assigned to an emergency planning zone, and they can't be assigned to more than one uh, currently. But that's not how reality works, right? If I'm downstream of the dam and I'm in the zone that would be flooded due to spillway flow, I would be receiving a warning from a high flow event that the dam hasn't even breached yet, but I'd be receiving a warning, hey, the dam's spilling, you, pro you need to evacuate because flooding's coming down. Now, imagine that the, the breach is occurring and there's a second warning coming in, right? The, the dam's breaching, you really got to evacuate. Those that were in the spillway zone started to evacuate. Once they hear that secondary warning, that secondary message, that's just going to jump them much more. They, it's going to give them much more reason to evacuate. So they're essentially jumping from one PAI curve to another. Currently in LifeSim, that's not the case. Um, so we want to, we need to work out the best way to have to overlap EPZs or how we're going to work that out, um, but we'd like to, to add that. Maybe not in 3.0, but in the future for sure. Shadow evacuation. Um, we currently can do this a little bit. We want to make the tools a little bit better. So shadow evacuation is those that are evacuating in that shadow region outside of the evacuation zone. You can extend your, pop your, your structure inventory beyond and just have that shadow zone as a separate EPZ, uh, but we want to make that a little bit easier to do. Uh, being able to include indirect life loss. We've talked, Jesse talked about indirect life loss and kind of what we learned about it and what we still need to learn about it. But the system can provide some really useful inputs to estimating indirect life loss, like how many people successfully evacuated. That's really valuable when you're trying to estimate indirect life loss. If it was hundreds of thousands of people, then that should, you can use those case histories from uh, hurricane evacuation and say, you know, we could have some serious indirect life loss here because there's so many people evacuating. And then individual risk. Uh, how many of you took the, D I think it's DLS 105. It's a risk, risk computations course with RMC. Anybody? Oh, taking it right now, right? Oh yeah, it's on the web. It's over a course of time, right? Have we talked about individual risk yet? 
societal versus individual. So in the core of engineers, we, we make decisions based off of some threat tolerable risk guidelines and damage levy safety off of, um, we call them the TRG tolerable risk guidelines. And um, that's for societal risk. The, the risk that, think about that as the risk that society is willing to take, the society, right? We're all willing to accept that we can, that we, if we cross a road, we might get hit by a car, right? Society has been willing to accept that risk. Um, individual risk is another metric we use for decision making where what is the individual who is most at risk of losing their life from the dam or levee? And this could be a person in their old folks home directly downstream of the dam, right? Where, where the, the, the likelihood that they're going to lose their life is really high. And so we want to be able to capture that. Right now in life sim, you can get at that to a certain degree by the fatality rate by structures. Do you guys remember that from the workshop? When you went through and found that fatality rate common, which structure had the highest fatality rate? Well, that can be a proxy for those people in that res 2 structure. They're probably the ones that, are, that have the highest individual risk, right? Because they're the most likely to lose their life in that structure. So bringing that data out into the forefront a little bit more to be transferred over into some risk analyses for decision making is another big one. GIS. Um, Improvements in GIS, implementing TINs, so triangulated irregular networks, uh, being able to implement that is a, is a big help for a lot of hydraulic models. Certain hydraulic models are only works in TIN space, so being able to visualize that, animate it on a TIN level, and so on is going to be a huge help. Uh, go to spe specified coordinates, so it would be nice to be able to click in, here's my X, here's my Y, zoom to its various GIS features, freeze attribute columns. How many of you were like, oh my God, there are 100,000 columns. It's so annoying. Where am I supposed to look? I'm getting confused. It'd be really nice to be able to freeze columns, hide columns, have a little bit more flexibility there. Improved performance of the GIS, um, that's going to be on there. It's already pretty dang performant, but we want to always want to improve. And then um, more editing tools. Uh, we just uh, saw one during the workshop there today, how it would be really nice if we could just cut out a polygon and paste a new one in there. Can't currently do that in life, so you have to go to another, you know, one of the big boys like ArcGIS or something. But we want to be able to continue adding these tools to help with our analysis. So we don't have to jump around from various tools to do our analysis. Try to make it more of a one-stop shop. Lasso select tool, already, uh, I'll demo that here in a second just to give you a sense. And then here's the nice one. The user interface is going to be redesigned. Uh, how many of you got really annoyed this week during the workshops when you had 30 different windows open, trying to figure, wait, did I have the plots open? Where'd the plots go? Now I have another window popping up. I'm like four windows in. We're going to have uh, the new framework is going to be in a dockable framework. So it's going to be single window. You can pop them out if you, you can undock, dock them back in. You can have your tab documents. It's going to be a much better user experience. Feels more like a workstation type environment. If anyone's used like AutoCAD or Photoshop or any of these other softwares is much more similar to that. Visual Studio, much more similar to that type of uh, experience. It's going to be really nice. It's, it makes for a much easier user experience, and it's all right there in your face, and that's going to be great. 